This is the panel that the NSA has been waiting for all day. All the spies in the audience, this is the one they've been looking forward to. It's the identity discovery panel. That's what the NSA is all about. All right, so we're gonna bring them up onto the stage. Uh, Moderated by Kashmir Hill, a senior online editor at Forbes, we have Ryan Freitas, co-founder and CPO of About.me, Lisa Camort Page, co-founder and COO of BlogHer, Brad Mounty, identity team lead at LinkedIn, and Bernard Desarnaud, GM and SVP of social products at Ning. Take it away. Right. It's always fun being the last panel of the day, or almost last. Um, so, uh, on the internet, having multiple personalities isn't really a disorder. It's kind of the standard operating procedure. Uh, so I was hoping we could just start uh, with you guys telling us which identities you're trying to unleash on your various sites. I think at About.me we're trying to uh, present a true self, or at least a 360 degree version of self. You can curate as many or as few of those identities that you've distributed across a bunch of different uh, platforms into a single place where people can leap off from that place to discover those pieces of who you are. Um, I think on BlogHer, you know, we're working uh, first and foremost with a community of content creators, um, and they are in turn working with a larger circle of their audience and readers, and these are lots of little micro communities that are formed and, and they're full of trust, it's trusted circles. And then, you know, they come together and mix and match in various different ways. At LinkedIn, we're focused on, obviously, the professional identity. And the, but not just the professional identity, the, the purest form of your professional expression, uh, as you've seen with a, a few of our latest product launches. Um, and that both being sort of the past, what you've done, as well as more of the aspirational and the what you're good at. Um, finally, on the Ning side, what we're really looking at is the, the total spectrum. We go from very niche community, very like small 20 people type where they all know really well each other to 10 million, 20 million people following a band type thing. So it depends. It goes through the spectrum of some is the real life personality, the real true self, all the way to completely baloney bullshit type. I want to be, you know, a painter. I want to be an artist or whatever. Uh, so I think when, uh, there was a time when people kind of got onto social networks and they were just so excited and they wanted to connect with everybody and it was just kind of click, click, um, friend me, follow me. Uh, and then we kind of hit this point where we started thinking about privacy issues and security risk. Uh, I'm wondering what you guys think is happening with identity. Uh, where are we now in terms of what people are trying to do there, uh, who they're trying to connect with? So on, on LinkedIn, this is probably the most frequent question that I get when I'm uh, at you know cocktail party or whatever. And so I've, I've actually started calling this the cocktail party test. Um, it, and so for, for me, it, it might vary, you know, it might vary for each of you in the room. But for me, the cocktail party test is like, if I met you at a cocktail party uh, and I was standing with myself and a few friends uh, or colleagues, could I, would I know enough about you and would I think highly enough of you to like introduce you to that set of friends? And but this varies widely and w based on the function of the person, um, like what they do for a living, um, as well as you know level of seniority. You know we see interesting things where people that are more senior or less senior are more or less willing to connect uh, with others on the platform. So but, who, who's more and who's less so, willing? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, it, it varies a lot by by industry and by function, but generally, you know, a CEO um, will be less likely to accept an invitation from, uh, you know, the the copy, you know, the guy in the copy room uh, if he feels like. The way I've heard it is if they felt like uh, he, he's trying to be part of a collection, like the, the guy in the copy room is trying to collect him as a, as a connection, um, which is an interesting, interesting way of putting it. But, um, you know, in, in general, it, it does sort of go back to, you know, as a, a proxy for your real world network. And these are people that you, you know or you should know um, and that, you're, that you, you know, the, the transpos transposition of your offline world into the online world. So. And this is, I think, one of the things that we think about uh, from a kind of a contrary perspective. We don't necessarily look at mapping a, a real-world network into what you do on About.me. Uh, we're trying to prevent uh, or project at least a little bit something more robust than a professional identity because we think there's more interesting elements to 
people who operate professionally, but also they have interests. They have a social graph. They have things that exist elsewhere. And providing a little bit more depth, a little bit more of an understanding of that individual in this representation of their identity allows people to connect with them on things that they might not already anticipate when they go into something like LinkedIn. Um, uh, seniority doesn't matter. What you do doesn't matter. You can present yourself any way you like. The outcome is whether or not I want to form a connection with you or not. And, and some, maybe somewhat counterintuitive, but we've actually found over time that a lot of the folks in our community are getting less pseudonymous, less anonymous. Uh, they're more willing to claim their identity because there's more opportunity. There's so much opportunity for content creators and for influencers and for this entire, there's an entire industry and way to make a living that didn't exist eight to 10 years ago. And so over time, people want to claim their expertise. They want to claim they spoke at our conference or they want to claim they got this piece syndicated and paid for on our site. And they start to use their real names and their pseudonym becomes a AKA, so to speak. It doesn't apply to every app they use, and there are apps where women are much less likely to use them than men because of the creepy factor and the feeling that it just goes a little bit too far in, in exposing them. But when it comes to their general identity online, we see a trend to, to claiming it. And is that just happening organically, or are you, like some companies, trying to push people? Like every time I go onto YouTube, Google's trying to get me They're to attach to my to real too, name to my YouTube I don't know why. channel, and I don't want to do that. So <laughs> um, are you guys pushing people to, to put their real identity out there more? I'd like to ask you, why don't you want to attach your real name to your YouTube? Uh, you know, I don't get. No, I don't know if I necessarily. Well, want I, I think <laughs> that's that's the crux, right? right? Online is very interesting in the way it's created the demultiplication of personalities, right? It used to be no. It's not like in the before online, people didn't have multiple personalities. It's just online. It's a lot easier to create a new ones everywhere, right? A new platform, a new community, a new social channel, whatever it is. At the same time, with online comes transparency. On Facebook, you're not going to bullshit your friends as to who you are. They kind of know who you are, right. even if you have a bunch of people who are not really friends. Same with LinkedIn, right? You can't pretend to be something you're not. I mean, LinkedIn is your business, you know, resume, whatever. So I think you know the the interesting thing is online. There's fragmentation, like like always. There's going to be some areas where you want completely anonymous privacy, whatever, and other places where you know you're public, and especially in this. Last week, you realize, oh my God, I better be careful now what I right. see on Twitter and Facebook and whatever. For me, it's about discoverability and that I want to have, you know, a slightly different journalist cashmere identity from my watching my friends' videos of their kids' cashmere. Um, and I think that's uh, something a lot of people are struggling with right now is how do you keep different identities alive on the web or are they necessarily just going to collide and do we have, as a society have to accept that that's our full self is always going to be there in a Google search. This is part of the puzzle, though. I mean, yes, Google search is actually a great way to think about it because whatever floats to the top of Google is effectively who you are as far as a, an ignorant searcher is. So do you want it to be your professional identity? Do you want it to be your video, you know, what you viewed? Uh, we have to remember that it's basically, a, a, right now, it's a kind of a, a jigsaw puzzle of different platforms at different levels of requesting identity from you and requesting more and more information about who you are. Um, the idea of allowing for people to, to have a certain degree of freedom or at least a few degrees of freedom in how they express themselves and how they present themselves, we take very seriously if only because it seems like we're trending towards a greater and greater identification between the, the offline and the online. The, a one-to-one -one relationship between those things is, it, when it's in the hands of algorithms, is more dangerous, I think, than allowing the user to, to define who they are for themselves. But I, I would guess that most of us in this room are not your typical user. The reason I keep ignoring that YouTube thing um, is because I want to read what exactly that means they're going to do to me or to my identity, and I don't have the time, and it seems like a pain in the ass. So I just keep saying ignore, ignore, because I don't want to deal with it. Same with Facebook. You know, I actually go look at those settings, and when they did the whole graph search, I'd spent a weekend doing an entire cleanse back to 2005 and looked at everything I'd ever done. That is not typical behavior, and so I think for most people, there and, and it's not my, it's not even my typical behavior when it comes to like that one more iTunes download. Do I accept their terms and conditions? Yeah, sure. You know, most of us are like that. We just accept it. So I, you know, my personal uh, approach is that I don't put anything online that I care about being private ever anywhere. You know. 
Yeah. And at, at LinkedIn, we, we really think that context matters and uh, the social, social norms and the ability to, to sort of split personal and professional and to purvey, again, that sort of best expression of professional self. Uh, and you know, to be able to, to put out there, again, sort of what you aspire to, again, uh, as well as what you, uh, what you have done, sort of like the, the, the work experience and that sort of thing. And being able to distance yourself from that you know, maybe ill-fated keg stand from grad school uh, and you know, that's, that's on a Flickr photo uh, or you know, on, on Instagram and be able to say, hey, I'm actually the, the, best, the best candidate for this job. Or when I'm looked up you know, for speaking at a conference that, you know, that people see the work that I've done and the best representation of me. Although, let's be honest, people have lied on their resumes for sure. ages. So putting, I mean, there's no guarantee that it's because that's the context, that's authentic identity either. That, that is true, um, but uh, we've actually seen and heard a number of anecdotes, in, uh, including uh, a, a fairly recent abrupt departure from the, the uh, Yahoo executive suite, where there was a uh, there was actually an inconsistency on a corporate bio that was not on his LinkedIn profile, um, and so the social norms on LinkedIn and the fact that this individual had hundreds of connections that were essentially reading his profile like in spot. Well, you actually don't have a degree in computer science. Um, you know, if, if that were to be put there. That, that does enforce a certain amount of uh, robustness to the system. Uh, in, in terms of the identity discovery that you're trying to push on your sites, um, you know, what are the strategies that you use or what are you seeing from users in terms of how they want to find other people? Uh, how do you help them find those people? Um, on the link site, they self-select themselves by the community they go to. Uh, and anecdotally, what was interesting, four or five years ago, we had this notion of a link or unique ID for any uh, visitor or member of any of the community built on link. And within three months, we had to stop it. It was backfiring on us. Users didn't want to have a unique link ID. They wanted to have the ability to have as many link IDs for each community as they wanted. So since then, we've not found a secret source on how, because we would like to push that. At the same time, we, we really very carefully, you know, monitoring what, how much can we push before it becomes, you know, counterproductive, to say the least. So you pulled back because users didn't like it? No, they hated it. I mean, the point, I think about privacy. Um, we have a lot of self-help type communities on the, right? People who have, you know, medical conditions or uh, addictions. You go to an addiction website, you don't necessarily want to tell the world that you're, you have whatever addiction. So. I don't think we can generalize it's going to be privacy this way, privacy that way, and, and this and that. I think the reality is online is creating transparency. So you know on Facebook, you know on Twitter that you have or LinkedIn, you have transparency, right? But if you go on the drugs rehab whatever dot com, you might not want that. I think there's a difference between how, your real world identity and a persistent online identity. And so BlogHer, from the beginning, people can sign up for BlogHer as long as they just have a username of their choice and a valid email that no one sees, but we check that it's some way we can contact them. Um, and so when, the first, when it first came out with Google Plus and how they wanted to force everyone to use their real names, and there was a real uproar with a lot of folks because just because they didn't want to use their real name doesn't, doesn't mean it wasn't their persistent identity that they'd had online for years. Um, and so I think that that kind of identity is, is valid and just as uh, meaningful in the online space as knowing my real name. You know, um, I think they're equivalent in value and authenticity. I don't think we deal with as much with the, the divide between these kinds of identities because most of the people who use our service are looking to be found in some way. They're presenting, they're, they're publicly sharing. Um, we, I think as we've come up to scale at About.me, have, have focused on different opportunities to start really providing discovery as a, a, a core component of the product. And I think we're at, uh, kind of at a, at a point where we can now start getting a little bit more intelligent about the people that we put in front of you, if you so choose. Um, we see people discovery as a kind of a core feature going forward. It, it's, it's what we're building into the next version of our iOS app. It's how we're thinking about the future of the product. Um, we want to be able to, uh, to connect you with people that you're interested in finding and not give you a, a ton of things that you wouldn't be interested in. Um, search is a fantastic thing, and, and LinkedIn has, I think, led the way in a lot of ways, both within the site and uh, the, the, their efforts on Google. 
Um, I think that we can provide, because of the aesthetic nature of, of Abatami, the, the, the highly visual nature, we can provide something that uh, really kind of uh, is a natural projection from what we've done to this point to, to put people in front of you that you might actually be interested in connecting with. Uh, the last panel was talking about how uh, dystopic fiction is, is big today. Uh, and one of those uh, novels uh, was Super Sad True Love Story. And there's a lot there about identity, um, specifically in uh, the way that it changes so that people are ranked more. Uh, as you're moving around, you know, you have facial recognition or some kind of way of projecting who you are. And you can see all of the ratings of a person in terms of their credit score. Um, is that using Google Glass or? It, it was like a Google Glass, like, um, device, um, other scores that I can't, can't say here in terms of vulgarity, but um, I, I wonder what the future holds in terms of ranking. Like we saw that a little bit with LinkedIn when you guys broke out the endorsements and all of a sudden we all had people endorsing us and uh, users were freaking out because they didn't know why this person was endorsing them or who the person was because they didn't realize they were part of their network. Um, but what does identity hold in the future in terms of being rated, ranked, um, reviewed by other people? So, so I think on LinkedIn, in, endorsements is really, um, you know, sort of the, the first step in what we see is sort of a, a professional reputation graph, so to speak. I mean, it's, it's, it's an, up to this point, it's been sort of a function of uh, what's on your resume and then who you're connected with. And then if someone's connected with you, they can sort of explore, if you choose to let them, they can sort of explore what your graph looks like. Um, so what we've, what we've done is taken it a step further and to incorporate skills and then allowing you to be endorsed for those skills and, or, and allowing other people in your network to su suggest skills that your uh, skills or areas of expertise, the things you're, you're good at and to endorse you for that. Um, I mean, if you think about sort of, sort of the, the logic continuation of this you can you can start to derive some really interesting things about um, you know who you know if you're looking for a candidate that's good with uh, that's great with with Java or Hadoop or something um, if you go to look at their profile you know you're, you are going to look at their their work experience you know no doubt about it but the fact that their their top ranked endorsement is is for Hadoop or for Java that's another signal that will allow you to make a, a smarter decision that will sort of a it's it's a discovery because you probably arrived there from search, um, but then it's also sort of validation, like almost a crowdsourced validation or wisdom of the crowd approach to, uh, to verification or validation and ranking. So you're saying which thing on the resume you're actually really good at among this whole selection. That's right. And, and again, nothing, no endorsement sort of taken uh, as a single data point is necessarily value. It's again, in aggregate, the fact that, you know, product management is my most endorsed skill and I have 99 plus endorsements for that, uh, which is something that I'm actually proud of. And the fact that, you know, I'm endorsed by Reed Hoffman for product management and all this stuff. But the fact that somebody coming to my profile sees that and that I perceive that to also be the best representation of my professional self. I think ranking as a kind of a applied blanketly across a graph is kind of like a blunt instrument. Um, there's a piece that's missing from that, and it's the choice of the user. Do I want to be found? Do I want to be ranked? Do I want to be considered an expert in this topic or that? Uh, we just recently acquired uh, WeFollow, which is uh, you know a way to get found and promoted on Twitter. Uh, we have learned a couple lessons from Jeff, who's the founder. Um, and we're going to be incorporating that into the product, but only for users who are interested in being considered or followed or discovered based on a particular topic. There's that point of choice that's important to users to determine whether or not ranking is important to them. If it's not, there's absolutely no valid, there's no valid use for it. But if it is, it can be a way for them to increase the chances of their discovery. I also think it's a very different environment between professional you know, what you're talking about in the professional context and then the personal context. There have always been ways, dating back to blog roles, where you signify or you signal who you think is super valuable in your life. And, you know, you had a blog role and these are the people I read all the time. And when people found you and liked you, they would follow the breadcrumbs to those people. And that's how we used to find people online, you know, is following the breadcrumbs. And I still think that's the best way. Um, so there, there have always been in your personal life, but in your personal life, you don't actually go and rank, you know, your friends. And, and I think that in particular, I don't know if this is a gendered thing that I find a lot of women in our community are really resistant to anything that's so codified, that's so, like, it's, it's, it's fluid, you know? And um, so I think some of the tools, like you said, are blunt instruments, and people still really are showing how they rank people by where they comment, what they read, how they behave. At the same time, that's the reality. It's just happening, right? 
people are spending more time online, leaving more traces online, and people, companies are creating score. End of story. I mean, like it, embrace it, reverse engineering, SEO specialist. I'd like to know how you get 99 plus on product management. We'll talk after. I mean, it's, it's, it's the way it is. I mean, it's like, we like it. No, I mean, sometimes I find the LinkedIn stuff really, really annoying. But it's, it's there. So different sites have really different strategies in terms of how you control your identity once you are on a site. And so we have a question from the audience that's uh, directed at LinkedIn. And they want to know why LinkedIn doesn't allow you to explicitly block people like you can do on other networks. Uh, to, OK, so I'm going to interpret the question as blocking in terms of uh, like an inbound connection. Because you, like, there, you, like you can't be seen oh, to, by to, like this complete other person. OK, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I, the, I guess the, the, the fundamental philosophy is like you're, you're on LinkedIn to, to, to be seen, to be found. Um, and you can block all inbound communication. From uh, from certain individuals, and you can flag for, um, you know, if there's definitely if there's a sort of terms of service violation, absolutely. Um, but we yeah we don't we don't have the the sort of Facebook like privacy controls because you know we fundamentally believe you you establish this professional you know presence so that you are found by uh, by the world and and seen for for who you are. So. Do other people have good uh, uh, strategies on their sites for? controlling your identity once you have things there, if there are certain people you don't want to see what you're doing? I think, generally speaking, any community management, that's one of the first skills to be mas to master is like how do you deal with you know, people who are offensive and so forth, and it's, it's an art. I mean, it's very, very complicated, and that's the key to thriving communities. Is you need to find the right balance between, so it's not just software and algorithm, it's really curation and people management of those communities. I think also, I mean, we can provide as many fine-tuned uh, fine controls for what you share and how you're contacted, but if you are in the position of providing a, a product like uh, LinkedIn or about to, I mean, where the, the supposition is that you're putting yourself out there for discovery, it does come down to, I can prevent contact from that person, but if I'm putting myself out there, it is a public profile. There are no private profiles on about.me or LinkedIn. Well, to an extent, you can, you can turn different pieces on and off. That's, yeah. it's the controls that we provide. Um, I think the, the, the thesis behind it or the general design sense behind it is that you're using the product to be found in some capacity. Um, we handle these kinds of things where uh, somebody contacts us and says we don't want to be contacted very seriously and we make certain that there's no potential threat to that individual. Um, but beyond that, there's only so many steps that you can take. And we're not really about um, blocking. We don't block people, but it is all about moderation and moderating the comments and moderating every interaction. And letting people know when they're violating the community standards. And in fact, a lot of people end up having conversation that never expected to want to talk to each other. But when it's done in a civil environment, you can actually find common ground. So it's a really interesting phenomenon we see. Um, last year, I made Reddit really angry because I wrote a post suggesting that people without Facebook profiles were suspicious. And it was based on what I was seeing kind of in job communities and around some criminal cases. Uh, and it came up again as we were talking before this panel started. Uh, and I'm just wondering, um, you know, in light of LinkedIn not letting people uh, block, you know, what is the future for people who do want to be private, who don't want to broadcast a lot of information about themselves online? Uh, how do they, you know, what do they do? Well, I think they have the opportunity to control their environment. And, you know, I, I'm not very active on Facebook. And my co-founder, Lisa Stone, isn't on Facebook at all. And the, but she has a very vivid, rich, full online persona and identity that comes from all the other stuff she does. I do think we were agreeing before the panel that if you're going to hire someone and you go to Google them and you can't find anything about them, that's a little creepy now. And I do think that will give you problems. But I think you can choose to eschew the social tools and, and focus on the professional well, tools. But what if you're a person who has been stalked or something like that, and you're trying to keep a, a clean uh, footprint or identity because you don't want somebody coming after you? This is the, uh, the point where the existing tools are not uh, they, are, they try to go for mass audience, and so they're, th they're therefore not absolutely um, configurable to the needs of, of a very absolutely a threatened audience. Um, I think, or I hope, that we all take that into account when we're, when we're making the choices that we do in, in terms of product direction. That said, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an inflection point for getting to a certain level of scale before you're able to actually kind of justify some of those things. Um, 
I think there's an opportunity for community standards and other things to come into play, but there is going to be a point where the product evolves to, yes, you have to be able to preserve some privacy going forward. Otherwise, you just, you're preventing a whole population from even having anything online at all. Well, and we have had, um, in fact, employees who, um, they, their online presence is a persona, is an, a pseudonym, and one in particular I'm thinking of in, on my own team was because of a stalker background, and so her whole online persona used to be just this, this pseudonym. And then, but I knew who that pseudonym was. So learning about her whole other real life and her skills and like she's completely hireable in this other thing was fascinating to me. So she obviously had to let us know because um, we had to pay her and things like that. Um, but over time, even she has sort of gone more towards she connects her real life job and her real life name and her real life who she is with the pseudonym. And so clearly the, she didn't have a current stalker problem, or I'm sure she wouldn't have done that. She had a past one. Um, but yeah, so we accommodated for that. You know, we, we knew that that was what she needed, and so that, that was fine. But uh, on your question, I, I think personally that the fact of not having a Facebook profile is not suspicious, but it's clearly different. So if you have, you know, a very an older person, CEO of a big company that doesn't have a Facebook profile, you, be like, it's kind of normal. If you have a 20-something that wants a job in sales and marketing that doesn't have a Facebook profile or LinkedIn profile, then you find, oh my God, there's a problem there. So I think it depends on the context. Um, and then I think you know, people are still people. Some people have a great social life. They don't need Facebook. They don't need to do more bullshit online social activity. They're just happy with what they have. So we should be careful to not generalize everything again. Uh, what do you think about the future of identity discovery around location or the people that are actually around you in a given moment? Well, in a lot of our, we've done a lot of proprietary research on the women in our community and also the general population of women. And on most social apps, as most people here probably know, women are the majority of users and the majority of engagement. Like they're very, act they're more active. They're not just the majority of users on Twitter and Facebook, but they're more active. And the place where they lag behind um, location-based uh, services is one of those places. And it's because the benefit to me doesn't seem to outweigh the creepy to me. And until that gets fixed where there's more in it for, for you than the potential creepiness, um, I think that's going to be a place where women in particular are going to be like, show me, show me the value before I tell you where I am. I always do it after I leave, but, uh, or I often do it after I leave. Location-based discovery is also one of those things it's a, where it's an issue of scale. Like, we can talk about discovery in this room, or we could just talk about discovery within a, a, a several blocks of where I work, or we could talk about discovery in a neighborhood or a city. And getting that right seems to be the bane of a lot of different services that have tried. Um, Fine-tuning and making a, an estimation of, of where people want to find one another, uh, it, it depends on the audience. Uh, an audience like this might really want it for, for a room size audience, uh, or if, if you are just a casual user who's not in tech, who's away from tech, you may never see the need to, to, to meet someone who might work two blocks away from you. Um, making those estimations without full knowledge of the user, without full knowledge of the audience is kind of the creepy factor really comes in pretty quickly. And I, I would just add, Part, I mean, Pardon me, uh, our last thought, because oh, we're almost okay. done. I've got to make it count. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I mean, on LinkedIn, uh, uh, specifically on the mobile app, I mean, a, a very prime use case is like, I just met this guy at a, at a meeting, or I'm going into a meeting, or I'm at a conference, and so on. So it's, it's both the, the sort of look up and, which is, you know, a form of discovery, and then the uh, sort of the more serendipitous aspect. And, and we're, we're definitely, uh, you know, thinking in that direction, particularly, uh, you know, in the conference setting, but um, more to come there, I guess. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.